Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be talking about the Habits Masterclass, which was created and synthesized by me. Essentially what I've done here is I've pulled together the biggest ideas, the best ideas, from dozens of books that we've read on the channel about habits. And what I've done is put them together in a way that I believe gives you the best chance to not only take away the best information, but to also implement it directly into your life. This video is going to be a short introduction to what you can expect inside of the Habits Masterclass. And I think a great place to start is by asking a question. What are habits? The dictionary says here that a habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. James Clear says that habits are not a finish line to be crossed. They are a lifestyle to be lived. Charles Duhigg says that once you understand that habits can change, you have the freedom and responsibility to remake them. And Aristotle said that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. And of course, we need to think why are habits actually important? One of the main reasons is that most of our days actually run on habits. The way that we wake up in the morning, the way that we work through the day, the way that we go to bed at night, a lot of these things are on automatic. Up to 40% of our days are lived directly through habit. So what that is essentially saying is what you've done yesterday is more than likely what you're going to do today. That means that we're not really in control of our lives most of the time, actually our habits are. And if our days are run by our habits, that means that our weeks are also run by habits too, which means that our months, years, and decades all depend on habits. What are you other than a culmination of your habits? Really, you're nothing. Your whole entire life is really built upon the bedrock of the habits that you've either created for yourself or let be created for you. Why then do we pay such little attention to the habits that we have? Most of us know these types of things intuitively. We know that most of our lives are run on habits. Actually, we all have habits that we likely want to get rid of or habits that we want to add, but often they feel out of reach, impossible to change, and we decide to just ignore them rather than actively change them and take an active role in the either creation or getting rid of the habits that we have. Knowledge about habits are created, how habits are created, run, and destroyed is the most powerful knowledge of all, at least in my opinion. This course is going to give you control over your life by giving you control over your habits. If you cur currently feel powerless to change your habits, if you're unable to become who you want to be, if you feel like you're stuck in a Groundhog Day nightmare, this course is for you. And now let's talk a little bit about how this masterclass is going to work. I've read what I believe to be some of the best books on habits. Some examples here, but not limited to, are Atomic Habits, Tiny Habits, Mini Habits, The Power of Habit, Make It Stick, No Sweat, Mindset, Willpower and the Willpower Instinct, Focal Point, and dozens more books around the topic of habit, and also not directly related to habit, but I've weaved them into the mind map in a way that I think fits. And then what I did was pull out the most timeless principles, these skill-based, most practical principles that you can pull directly from the book and add into your life. Plus, I've added a few of my experiences through my learning journey and the journey of my coaching clients when it relates to habits. This course is for you, this is course is for your future, and this course is for your potential. All of the techniques that we'll talk about here are meant to actually be used. Honing in on your habits via action, of course, is the name of the game. I don't want you just to take notes inside of this masterclass. I want you to follow along with the mind map and the exercises down below. They're designed specifically to make this masterclass stick. And before the end of the video here, what I wanted to do is give you a brief overview of the different aspects of habits and what I've put together inside this mind map. 
So the first place that we're going to start with our Habits Masterclass is with willpower. Of course, where else would you start when you're talking about habits? We're going to talk about what willpower is and put ourselves through a willpower training camp. After we've been through that willpower training camp, we're moving into the fundamentals, the habits that I believe are going to set us up with a foundation to build all other habits upon. The number one fundamental habit that I'm going to teach you is called the focusing question. And then we're going to talk about habits around breathing, moving, and sleeping. Next, we're going to talk about keystone habits. What keystone habits are and the habit of starting, the number one keystone habit that you can put into your life right now as you're watching this masterclass and it will have an outsized impact on your habits in the future. Our next big idea is about why. Getting clarity around our why, understanding that we're built for instant gratification and how to build that into our habits and how to build that into our why. The next big idea is about daily. We're going to talk about why habits form in the way that Jerry Seinfeld gets himself to write comedy every single day. Our next big idea is easy and about making it stupid. One big idea that you can take away, even if you don't get into the habits masterclass, is that you want to make your habits as stupid as you possibly can. Make it so that you can do it on any day, even your worst possible day. And we're going to talk about what that looks like as far as building habits. Our next big idea is if then. We're going to talk about making if then, if this then that statements. We're going to talk about if then cues. And I'm also going to give you my favorite IFTT, if this then that habit. Our second last point is about process. We're going to talk about the three steps to building a habit. We're going to talk about the success cycle. And we're going to talk about what the process of mind mapping looks like. Our final point, of course, we're bringing it full circle directly from willpower and into mindset. We're going to talk about who you really are and whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. So welcome to the Habits Masterclass. If you're watching this on the YouTube video, you can click below and enter into the Habits Masterclass. If you're already inside of the Habits Masterclass, please enjoy the upcoming lessons and join the free coaching session that you can use to help you integrate some of the knowledge that you're getting inside of the masterclass. Enjoy. Let's talk about willpower, specifically how willpower relates to habits. The first thing we're going to do is start off with the definition. What is willpower? And this is coming directly from Willpower by Roy Bomeister. I recommend that you check out that book. It's a really good book on everything willpower related. The quote that I pulled from the book goes like this. The result, after dozens of experiments in Bomeister's lab and hundreds elsewhere, is a new understanding of willpower and of the self. We want to tell you what's been learned about human behavior and how you can use it to change yourself for the better. Acquiring self-control isn't as magically simple as the techniques in modern self-help books, but neither does it have to be as grim as the Victorians used to make it. Ultimately, self-control lets you relax because it removes stress and enables you to conserve your willpower for the important challenges. We're confident that this book and this book's lessons can make you your life not just more productive and fulfilling, but also easier and happier. And we can guarantee that you will not have to endure any sermons against bare ankles. So this is kind of an interesting introduction to the book of willpower. But really what I wanted to talk about is, is willpower the key to everything, especially when it comes to habit creation? When we want to make a change in our life, we know that we must rely on willpower. It's a big part of the equation. Whether we're trying to break a bad habit or we're trying to cultivate a good one, willpower is there. Resisting temptation, foregoing distraction, or putting ourselves into uncomfortable situations all require us to use willpower. But what is willpower at the end of the day? Control exerted to do something or to restrain from impulses, or the ability to control your own thoughts and the way in which you behave. And that sounds pretty simple, right? It's just the control that we're using to stop ourselves from really acting on our worst impulses, I would say. Well, it is and it isn't. It's not actually that simple. Most self-help books completely forget 
about this part of the change process, thinking that willpower is just something that you can easily conjure up. But if you don't have the skills and the understanding necessary to use willpower, can you ever really make a change? Right? This is the beginning of the habit process. It's one piece of the habit equation that I think a lot of books kind of just skip over, which we're not going to skip over here today. Can you ever really make a change without knowing and understanding and having the skill to use your willpower? In my opinion, no. This would mean that if you don't know about willpower, actually all other self-help, all other habit building concepts are going to end up being pretty useless for you. So what we're going to talk about here today is how can we cultivate more willpower? And that's really what we're going to learn in the rest of this mind map node. We'll also learn how to use limited willpower in ways to maximize our results and save more of it for truly dire situations. And what I mean by that is we don't want to use all our willpower up on the small everyday habits that we're trying to create. We want to save our willpower for things that are essentially more difficult. And really what we're talking about here is going to the willpower training camp. And this comes directly from the willpower instinct, another great book. There is a growing scientific evidence that you can train your brain to get better at self-control. What does willpower training for your brain look like? Well, neuroscientists have discovered that when you ask the brain to meditate, it gets better not just at meditating, but at a wide range of self-control skills, including attention, focus, stress management, impulse control, and self-awareness. People who meditate regularly aren't just better at these things. Over time, their brain becomes finely tuned willpower machines. Regular meditators have more gray matter in their prefrontal cortex, as well as regions of the brain that support self-awareness. So what does a willpower training camp look like? We've established that we need willpower in order to make our habit building process a little bit easier on us. But what does building willpower, what does building the skill of willpower actually look like? Well, attending a willpower training camp. And that looks like meditation. There is some amazing science on the power of meditation to almost instantly increase our willpower. Check it out. After 11 hours, researchers could see those changes in the brain. The new meditators had increased their neural connections between regions of the brain important for staying focused, ignoring distractions, and controlling their impulses. Another study found that eight weeks of daily meditation practice led to increased self-awareness in everyday life as well as increased gray matter in the corresponding areas of the brain. It may seem incredible that our brains can reshape themselves so quickly, but meditation increases blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, in much the same way that lifting weights increases blood flow to your muscles. The brain appears to adapt to exercise in the same way that muscles do, getting both bigger and faster in order to get better at what you're asking it to do. So really here, what we're talking about is starting off with meditation. And the reason that I wanted to start off with this first is, of course, we're going to gain more willpower. We're going to have a better understanding and a better ability of how to use our willpower. And that's extremely important. The habit building process, no matter how much we break it down into a step-by-step -step process backed by science to make it as easy as possible for you to change your habits or to build new habits, there's going to be an element of willpower in there no matter what. So of course we want to start with meditation. But another kind of meta reason we could start with meditation is because meditation is going to help us decide what habits to build. We need to have a clear mind, a clear conscience, and the ability to choose the habits that we want to build mindfully. And that's what we're talking about today as well as lifting weights for the brain, building that willpower ability. Meditation, of course, has some amazing in-the-moment benefits, just like exercise. After you get a good workout in, you feel great. You have increased energy, decreased stress, and a clear mind. Those are all good places to start with exercise. But the studies actually show the long-lasting benefits of meditation are pretty insane. A small amount of meditation makes your life a heck of a lot better. So what are we waiting for? We know meditation 
is very important. And we're talking all about habit building today. So what are we waiting for? From Willpower by Roy Bomeister, we learned that almost any type of meditation or prayer will increase your willpower. Here's the one that I recommend for beginners, habit stacking mindfulness. We're going to kind of build in a lot of the things into these three steps that we're going to learn throughout the mind map, but we're starting with mindfulness. This is the first thing I want you to start with. You can think of it like a habit. You can think of it like a willpower training camp. However you want to look at it, willpower is going to be built through mindfulness and mindfulness is going to need to be a habit. So here's the first habit I want you to try and adopt. We'll talk more about the ins and outs of how to adopt this habit and et cetera later on. Step number one is brew your warm drink in the morning. Almost all of the clients that I've ever dealt with have drank coffee or tea or something in the morning, and that's a piece of their daily routine that they almost would never miss. The reason that I wanted to attach the warm drink directly to that, if we get a little bit more into habit building and habit stacking, is because what you want to do is attach a habit to something that you're already doing almost without fail. So brewing a warm drink in the morning is likely a part of your already daily routine. Stack your meditation on top of that. Step number two is to sit on your couch and enjoy that drink. But here's the catch. Do it without distraction. Constantly bring your attention back to the delicious drink in your hands. How does it feel on your tongue? How does it feel going down your throat and into your stomach? Really bring mindfulness to that piece of your day. Step number three, of course, is whoops, you're meditating. Again, we want to make our habits as easy as we possibly can. We're going to talk about that a little bit further in a a node inside of the mind map, but make them as easy as you possibly can. That's a very simple way to build a habit. And what we're doing is building a habit that's going to make all our other habits a little bit easier. We're going to attend a willpower training camp every single day and make building the rest of our habits a little bit easier. Let's talk about some fundamentals. Let's talk about some fundamental habits that I've picked up from some of the books that we've gone over on the YouTube channel, implemented into my own life, and I've helped clients implement them into their own lives. I believe these are the ones that you want to focus on. If you don't already have these imprinted, if you don't already have these as dedicated habits, I recommend that you try and pick them up. And essentially what we'll do is we'll go over the fundamentals We're going over the keystones, and then we're going into all of the processes of how you can actually implement them into your life. So we talked about willpower already. We talked about how we can gain more willpower through meditation. Let's talk about the focusing question. This comes from The One Thing, one of the first books that I ever did on the YouTube channel. It says that the quality of any answer depends on the quality of the question. The questions that we ask ourselves determine the answers that eventually become our lives. Pay attention to the questions that you're asking yourself right now, and you'll realize that you're exactly where your questions have led you. So the idea here is that the habit that we're talking about is actually the questions that we habitually ask ourselves. What's the one thing that I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? That's the focusing question. And what I'm suggesting here is that you adopt that question as a habit. What's one thing that I can do right now that such that by doing it, everything else will be a little bit easier, whether it's everything else today, everything else this week, or everything else this month. What can I do right now that's going to make my life a little bit easier in the future? So what's the one thing that I can do? Let's break this question down a little bit further. This sparks focus. It forces specificity. One thing. We're not talking about what are some of the things that I can do. We're talking about one thing. And it directs you to choose something that's actually possible, right? What's the one thing I can do? I can do. Take responsibility for the thing that you can do right now that's going to make your life a little bit easier. Such that by doing it is kind of the middle of our question here, our focusing question. And that's the bridge between just doing something and doing something for a specific purpose. Often we go through our lives on autopilot following our habits, but this is kind of a habit that allows you to get out of autopilot, allows you to look forward and say, which of these things that I'm doing are actually leading to my desired result. So it lets you dig 
that lets you know to dig deep because once you do the one thing, everything else is going to happen for you or it's going to be at least easier along the way. And the kind of end part of the question is, what's the one thing that I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? So if you give me a long enough lever, I can move the world. That's what Archimedes said. The act of finding the first domino in the line. So we talk about this inside of the inside of the One Thing book, but essentially you can line up dominoes. The first one can be the size of a regular domino, very easy to push over. But then the next domino can be almost twice the size, and the one after that can be almost twice the size. And I think it's something like 51 dominoes in, you have a domino that would reach all the way to the moon. And the idea here is that most things don't need to be difficult. Most things just need to be started. So what's the one thing that I can start right now such that by starting it, it will elicit a chain of domino-like events that will make everything else a little bit easier? So that's one habit that I think we should pick up. What's one thing that I can do right now such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. Now, the cue for that question might be something like, oh, I'm feeling bored, or oh, I'm feeling lonely, or oh, I'm noticing that I'm going to go into some of the bad habits that I've had previously. It's a good time. It's a good cue to use to use that focusing question. Now, we've got three other kind of more physical habits that I suggest that we adopt as well. Number one is breathing. This comes from the willpower instinct. You won't find many quick fixes inside this book, but there is one way to immediately boost your willpower, coming right after meditation, of course, that we talked about before. Slow your breathing down to four to six breaths per minute. That's 10 to 15 seconds per breath. Slower, of course, than you normally breathe. It actually feels quite slow when you do it for the first time, but not difficult, and with a little bit of practice and patience, you can certainly do it. Slowing down the breath actually activates your prefrontal cortex and increases heart rate variability, which is a huge part in stress relief, which helps you shift the brain and body from a state of stress to self-control mode. A few minutes of this technique will make you feel calm, in control, and capable of handling your cravings or challenges. So you might be thinking, Ethan, you know, I thought we were going to talk about some breathing techniques that are going to help me achieve X, Y, and Z. This is really just a breathing technique to help me calm down. Why is that important? Well, of course, we talked about the importance of willpower. And one thing that we need to know about habits is that quite often we are doing certain habits that we want to get rid of as a coping mechanism for stress. So my suggestion here is let's adopt some habits that are going to help us stave off stress. This one staves off stress in the moment. Our breathing and our moving and our sleeping are all going to stave off stress in the long term as well. So if we want an immediate path to willpower in the moment, which again, willpower is a fundamental ingredient of habits, one way that we can do it is slowing down our breathing. 10 to 15 seconds per breath is the sweet spot. That means you take a big, deep breath in for maybe 10 seconds and a big, long breath out for maybe five seconds or vice versa, whatever you're more comfortable with. That's four to six seconds in and six to eight seconds out. That's a great way to get started. Start with just four and six, four and six. Test it out right now. Notice the immediate calming response that this has on your body and on your mind. It's pretty cool, right? This connects perfectly to something that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, our if-then statements in other books. If then statements allow us to choose how we're going to react in a certain situation before we're forced to react. We were talking a little bit about this with the focusing question. If you're feeling bored or if you're feeling yourself kind of following into a negative habit that you're doing to cope with a certain amount of stress, uh, certain emotions and that sort of thing, an if then statement is extremely helpful to not only help us remember to breathe, but also help us to remember that focusing question. The if-then statements are extremely helpful, and again, we'll go into them a little bit deeper later on in the mind map. It's often hard to respond effectively in the moment when you're in flight or fight mode. Here's an example. If I feel stressed at work before a presentation, 
Then I will step outside and do two minutes of slow breathing. So you're setting yourself up with an easy kind of algorithm. You know that you're going to do something when you're feeling a certain way, or you know you're going to do something when you're stressed in a certain way. I recommend that you check out these other books if you're wanting to look into if-then statements. Of course, the main one is Rethinking Positive Thinking, which of course we're going to talk about inside this mind map, but also Willpower in Solving the Procrastination Puzzle. All books talking around habit, all books talking around breaking bad habits. A lot of people are talking about if-then statements, and specifically this one, I believe this if-then, if I'm stressed, then I'm going to try to focus on my breath. That's a great habit. It's a great if-then statement to put into your life. Next, we're going to talk about the fundamental of moving. And this comes from the power of habit. Charles Duhigg says that when people start habitually exercising, even as infrequently as just once a week, they start changing other unrelated patterns in their lives, often unknowingly. Continuing on, he says, typically people who exercise start eating better. and They become more productive at work. They smoke less and they show more patience with colleagues and family. They use their credit cards less frequently and say they feel less stressed. It's not completely clear why this happens, but for many people, exercise is a keystone habit that triggers widespread change. Exercise spills over, said James Prokestra, a University of Rhode Island researcher. There's something about it that makes other good habits easier. So again, we're talking about the habits that are fundamentals. And for me, a fundamental needs to be not only a good habit for most people, but also let's make our other habits, the habits that might be unique to us, let's make those as easy as we possibly can. Because being human is hard, and being a human who wants to change is even harder. Good thing is that exercise is kind of like a magic elixir. Coming from owning my own gym, I know this to be true. Exercise is a lot like meditation in certain ways. So often, people would come into my gym just to lose weight, only to leave completely different people, with tons of willpower, changing habits that had nothing to do with exercise. They changed this one habit from something like a non-gym goer to a gym goer, and it literally changed their entire lives. Often people would switch careers, make huge life changes, or just have different personalities. All things that I think were underlying, they were under the surface, but they didn't feel like they could change them on the outside because they didn't have the willpower, they didn't have the ability, they didn't have the belief that they could do it. And these changes all happened because of the confidence and self-determination that they gained in the gym. Exercise as the magic elixir. Other books that we've talked about, such as No Sweat, uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit later, I really believe that exercise doesn't have to be 45 minutes sweaty gym session. Exercise can be a 15-minute walk with a loved one. Exercise can be going out and gardening. Exercise can be doing a few push-ups every time you take a little break. So exercise is a fundamental habit. And I know we didn't talk a lot about how to put exercise in your life specifically, but that's because we're going to cover that a little bit later in the mind map. Just remember, these are the fundamental habits that I suggest that you get started with. Of course, meditation and willpower got their own node here in the mind map. And then these three are other important habits that I believe that we should put in. The next one is about sleeping. And you might not think that sleeping and habits are directly related, but let me tell you that they are. This comes from Sleep Smarter by Sean Stevenson. The word word ritual is derived from the Latin word ritus, meaning a proven way of doing something. A ritual is a small sequence of step-by-step actions that put you in a certain mood, state, or frame of mind to get something done. So he's talking about the habit of sleep. Whether or not you've had a history of sleep problems, a regular bedtime ritual will help you wind down and prepare your body for the best sleep possible. Jessica Alexandra of the Sleep Council said, a bedtime ritual teaches the brain to become familiar with the sleep times and wake times. It programs the brain and the internal body clock to get used to a set routine. So this is from tip number 21 inside of Sleep Smarter, ritualize your night. 
This is one of the fundamentals that I think everyone should do. A sleep ritual to me is really a meta tip. Again, it's a meta habit that we can use to help encompass a lot of other tips that have already been given inside of the mind map. Not only is it going to help your brain know it's time to sleep, but it can also link it up with other habits. So for example, first you have a hard bedtime, say of 9 p.m. Next, you have to have a full shutoff time, say 7.30 p.m. Turn down your AC or open up a window so the room gets a little cooler. Do your deep meditative breaths and spend your time reading or with someone that you love. So this is kind of, again, a meta tip, right? The more sleep you have, the more willpower you have, the more able you're going to be able to stick to your habits and your plans. But also, it shows us that building just one habit of sleeping actually encompasses a lot. Because if we want to sleep a little better, we might be better to move during the day. And as inside of this tip here, inside of this sleep ritual, if we want to sleep a little better, maybe we should focus a little bit on breathing. And to get that all done, what's the one thing that you can start with in order to make all the other things easier or unnecessary? So those are the fundamental habits that I believe we should be focusing on. And next, we're going to move on to the keystone habit. We're going to talk about the one thing a little bit deeper. Now we're going to talk about keystones. Now, keystones are an interesting piece of architecture. Essentially, what they are is they are the middle piece inside of a stone ring. So you're going through a stone doorway and you have one piece in the middle that's just a little bit bigger than the rest. And essentially, that one keystone, that one stone in the middle, is actually what's supporting the rest of the stones around it. It's what's keeping the entire doorway structure together. And that's what we're talking about today as well, is this one habit that's going to keep the rest of your habits stable. It's going to keep the structure going. And that's what we call a keystone habit. It actually comes from a few different books. The quote that we're going to talk about right here is from The Power of Habit. It wasn't the trip to Cairo that had caused the shift. Scientists were convinced, or the divorce, or the desert trek. It was that Lisa had focused on changing just one habit, smoking, at first. Everyone in the study had gone through a similar process. By focusing on one pattern, what is known as a keystone habit, Lisa had taught herself to reprogram the other routines in her life as well. And what I said here was, it's really like it's one habit to rule them all. The keystone habit and its effect. Charles tells us, Charles Duhigg in the book The Power of Habit, tells us a story of a lady who quit smoking and her entire life changed to boot. Some people might think that she had a psychotic break. It was almost her entire personality, the things that she liked and disliked, completely changed. She threw her old life away and became a completely new person. But that's not the case. She didn't have some sort of psychotic break. She simply changed a keystone habit. And here's the basic idea of keystone habits. There is one habit in your life that if you changed it, it would have a huge outsized impact on you. It will change your preferences, your personality, and your self-confidence. Plus, it usually is one of the most difficult habits to change meaning that every other habit is a little bit easier after you've been through it. So what we're thinking about now, after we've gone through things like the, the fundamentals, we've talked about willpower as kind of the main thing that we want to be doing as far as changing our habits. Now we want to talk about keystone habits. We want to talk about specifically what's one habit that you could change such that by changing it, everything in your life is much more likely to change and will be much easier to change. So before we get into the actual how-to of changing our habits, I want you to think about which habits should I be changing. That's what we're putting our magnifying glasses on in the very beginning of this masterclass. So what is your keystone habit? That's what we want to think about now. Think about a habit that will have the most positive impact on your life. It could be something like exercising regularly, as we talked about before. It could be quitting drinking. It could be meditating, like we talked about before as well. It could be something like reading more. Once you've made the commitment and changed that habit, the rest of the habits that you're trying to change will be easier. That's what we want to look in, look at for a keystone habit. You'll have a newfound energy and be ready to tackle the next change head on. And that's the power of a keystone habit. That's what we want to change first. 
Of course, we definitely need to know all of the processes that are going to go into changing a habit, but we also want to make sure that we're changing the right habits first. So the keystone habit that I would say is probably the one that you want to implement first is the habit of starting, the habit of getting started. And this comes from A Mind for Numbers, a really great book all about learning, but also a good book on habits. We procrastinate about things that make us feel uncomfortable. Medical imaging studies have shown that math phobes, for example, appear to avoid math because even just thinking about it actually hurts. The pain center of their brains light up when they contemplate working on math. But there's something important to note. It was the anticipation that was actually painful. When the math phobes actually did the math, the pain disappeared. Procrastination expert Rita Emmett explains, the dread of doing a task uses up more time and energy than doing the task itself. Avoid doing something painful seems sensible, right? Avoiding doing something painful seems sensible. But sadly, the long-term effects of habitual avoidance can be really nasty. And that's actually what we're talking about today. We're talking about habits, we're talking about how to build habits, how to change habits, but one underlying theme around habits that I feel like isn't talked about that much, but Barbara is talking about here, is this long-term effect of not changing the habits that we know we need to change. Procrastination is a single, monumentally important keystone bad habit. A habit, in other words, that influences many important areas of your life. Change it in a myriad of other positive changes will gradually begin to unfold. So what we're talking about here, we've talked about let's build up some willpower, let's look at these kind of fundamental habits that we'll want to build up so that we can continually grow our willpower. We've talked about the power of keystone habits. We've talked about the way that keystone habits work such that by changing one habit, it will change your entire life, change your entire being. And then I'm talking about the one most important keystone habit that I believe we should all be trying to implement and that's the keystone habit of quitting procrastination. Procrastination has terrible effects on the human mind. Once we start to not change the habits, once we start to not follow the things that we know we need to be doing, it becomes insidious. It becomes harder and harder with every passing moment to actually get started. And that's why I believe that procrastination should be using all of the different things that we're going to talk about later as far as how to build new habits. That should be the first thing that you tackle. The worst habit that you can have is almost certainly procrastination. Not only does procrastination ruin your chances of learning and growing, but once you start procrastination, it often leads to more procrastination. It's like an addiction. Procrastination makes us feel good in the moment, but long term, it's really destructive. While the pile of things that you have to do pile up, your resistance to doing them piles up even higher. So how do we overcome procrastination? Of course, we're going to talk about overcoming the habit of procrastination a little bit later. But in order to become, to get over procrastination, it really is a simple process. Pierce Steele, PhD, says that his number one tip to get started overcoming procrastination is simply just get started. Pierce Steele wrote an entire book called The Procrastination Equation. Really great book around the habit of procrastination, how to break the habit, how to become someone that immediately dives into something. But his main tip is just get started. And that's what we'll use when we're trying to overcome procrastination with our habit building in the future. Though it might seem easier said than done, as all habits generally are, it really is all about getting past the dread of doing the task, right? So Barbara talked about up here that really it's not even the task, the doing that we are so afraid of and we're, uh, that's causing us pain. Really what it is, is the dread of doing the task. The kind of moment before we do the task is really what causes us all the pain of procrastination. Because the task itself is actually so much easier, especially once you first get started. Here's a really good tip. So this is going to weave again into all the things we'll talk about as far as building habits, breaking bad habits. Step number one is notice yourself procrastinating. That's your cue. Right? You have to be self-aware and mindfulness and meditation definitely helps here. But step number one is notice yourself or ourselves procrastinating. And if we do that, you're likely also going to notice, hey, I'm not only procrastinating, but I'm anticipating pain when I'm going to actually go and do the thing. 
So we have to notice. That's step number one. Step number two is to commit to work for two minutes. So we're going to talk about a little bit later about making habits stupid small. Two minutes is stupid small. If you have to make a mind map video, if you have to read a book, if you have to do a coaching call, commit to two minutes first. And if you're procrastinating on that thing, which I definitely find myself procrastinating from time to time, just commit to those two minutes. Just get started. Step number three is that often after those two minutes, you'll notice that it wasn't as bad as you thought. And that's the exact same concept that we're going to talk about stupid small. Make it incredibly easy. Talk about that inside of the easy node. But what I want you to do is really think about keystone habits and really, really think about using the habit of getting started as your number one habit that you're going to use all of our different kind of processes. Try and try and use all of these processes coming up in the subsequent lessons inside this masterclass to overcome the habit of procrastination and replace it with the habit of getting started. It's going to make your fundamentals, your sleeping, your moving, your breathing, the focusing question a heck of a lot easier. It's also going to mean that you save up your willpower because the number one thing that's going to drain your willpower is the habit of procrastination. Again, the more you procrastinate, the more likely you are to procrastinate. It gets worse and worse as you continue to do it. So let's build a keystone habit. We're going to talk about the process of how to do that in a minute here, in the subsequent lessons. But I really want to underscore the habit of starting. That's the number one habit that I've learned is the most important because it's going to make our fundamentals easier and it's going to continue to give us more willpower throughout the day. Now let's talk about why. Let's talk about getting clarity around your purpose and how human beings are built for instant gratification and how you can actually use that to your advantage. Something that might have been stopping you from getting started can actually help you in the moment. We're going to talk about both of those two things. Let's start with getting a little clarity. This comes from The Focal Point by Brian Tracy. In this respect, clarity is terribly important. Successful people have tremendous clarity about who they are, what they want, and how they are going to get it. Unsuccessful people usually are unsure and confused about who they are, what they want, and where they're going. One powerful exercise that you can practice to supercharge your thinking and accelerate your results is called idealization. In idealization, you continually imagine the perfect outcome or solution for any problem in your life, any situation in your life. You project forward three to five years or even further and then create a mental picture of the kind of life and career that would be ideal for you in every respect. How clear are you about who you are, what you want, and how you're going to get there? This is very important when we're thinking about building habits because we need to have clarity around which habits we want to build. This is the one thing that differentiates successful people from unsuccessful people. A clear ideal of their future selves, work, and their accomplishments. Having clarity around each of these areas will help lead you to make the right choices about what habits to build and what habits to try and get rid of. Being foggy about any of these can leave you going in circles for years, decades, or even a lifetime. Of course, we talked about before how your habits are really who you are and your habits are really what you get done in your life, of course, clarity comes before which habits you're going to build. So how do we get clarity? Visualization, idealization. Visualize three to five years from now. Everything in your life has worked out perfectly. Each area of your life, these and many more, relationships, your health, your wealth, your mental, and your career in business. What does your ideal future look like in each of these areas? How about you? Let's write it down. Take some time and write this down. After doing that visualization exercise, write down what you saw. So relationships, health, wealth, mental, and career. Here's mine. I have a continually deeping, loving relationship with my girlfriend. I'm in the best shape of my life without struggling with food and exercise as I have in the past. I have enough savings in the bank to last me years, given my lifestyle. I have a clear mind and control over my emotions. This YouTube channel and my coaching business is a full-time endeavor, helping people better themselves. 
So if you want to create good habits, the first thing we need to do is start with why. You have to understand why you want to build these habits and you have to be deeply connected with it. You have to visualize your ideal future and continually keep that in mind. Because as we said before, building new habits takes a heck of a lot of willpower. And one of the ways that we continually renew our willpower is by getting clear on our why. Now let's talk about instant gratification. You might be wondering why that connects to our purpose. I'll talk about this in a second. But this quote comes from No Sweat. It's a really great book all about how you can get yourself to exercise for a lifetime. And she says inside the book, as it turns out, research shows that even reasons that found very sensible and important may not lead us to the results that we're seeking. So we talked about getting clarity, right? We talked about our why being extremely important, and I really do believe that. We can visit our ideal future and replenish our willpower continually. But what happens in the moment is you can't always access how sensible and important that clear version of the future might be. Some years ago, my colleagues and I conducted a study in which we examined the impact of people's reasons to start exercising on their actual involvement in exercise. And again, this is talking about exercise, but it really works the same across all domains of life, all the ones that we talked about in our getting clarity point as well. We first asked the participants to state their reasons or goals for exercising. As I just asked you, then to uncover their higher level reasons for exercising, we asked them why they cared about obtaining these particular benefits. My colleagues and I found that 75% of participants cited weight loss or better health, current or future, as their top reasons for exercising. The other 25% exercised in order to enhance the quality of their daily lives, such as to create a sense of well-being or to feel centered. And then we measured how much time they actually spent exercising over the course of the next year. The answer may seem counterintuitive, but it's true. The vast majority of participants whose goal were to lose weight and better health spent less amount of time of exercising, up to 32% less actually, than those with other goals. Think about that for a moment. Our most important and culturally accepted reasons for exercising in a, are, in, are associated with doing the least amount of exercise. How can that be? And the reason that I wanted to include this is, of course, because getting clarity is a well-known point. Getting clarity and knowing your ideal version of the future is a really well-known point. I, I'm not sure how well it's followed, given a lot of the coaching conversations that I have. I don't think people put much actual work into this. That's why I included it. I do believe it's very important. I believe you need to have clarity to know where you're going to go. But I don't believe that having clarity really leads to you actually going out and doing the things. And I'm sure many of you have probably experienced that as well. The reason why you exercise is the most important factor in whether you'll exercise or not. So a lot of people try to build new habits, try to get things done because they want this ideal version of the future. And of course, that's a great place to start, but you need to connect it to the moment. You need to connect it to instant gratification. And why is this true? Well, the truth is that human beings, it turns out, are hardwired to choose immediate gratification over our long-term benefits. So even though we know what we want to get done because we have a lot of clarity, we tend not to choose it. When we try to make decisions that will help us in the future with no connection to the day, we really struggle. And this, I believe, is the reason most of the coaching clients that I talk to are spinning their wheels. And they're connected maybe to their future, maybe they're not, but they're certainly not connected to the day-to-day. -day. Let's think about it for a second. Often, we don't save enough for retirement because we want to spend our money today. People smoke even though they know that the long-term effects, to re they want to relieve stress in the now rather than you know, deal with the long-term effects. Often, we eat too much right now without thinking about the long-term effects that obesity might have in the future. So really the question that we should be asking when we're getting clarity around our why and kind of determining what our purpose might be and the ideal version of our future is how can I connect that desired behavior, that desired outcome to immediate gratification? 
Instead of coming up with a vision of what you hope to accomplish at the end of the year and kind of letting that be your main motivator, connect your desired behavior or connect your desired vision or the ideal version of the future that we talked about before to instant gratification. So it's really a two-step process in determining your why and getting it connected to the moment. Let's get clarity and then let's connect it to some instant gratification. Here are a few examples. Exercise, instead of getting me to lose weight or you know get into better shape or whatever it might be, it actually helps me clear my mind in the moment. And that's the thing that I want to connect to. Eating healthy, eating a healthy lunch keeps my energy up. Of course, my three-year and five-year vision is to not deal with some of the food issues that I've dealt with in the past and to make sure that I'm uh, at my healthy best. But to connect it to the now, eating a healthy lunch keeps my energy up, and that's what I want to focus on. Meditating allows me to be calm instead of being anxious. So meditating has, of course, wide-ranging benefits. It has the ability to help me replenish my willpower. It helps me keep a clear mind and make better decisions. But it also just helps me keep a clear mind in the day-to-day, in the moment-to-moment, which is extremely effective at keeping my stress levels down, which really helps me in the moment. So the purpose of why was to get clarity around why we're trying to build the habits so that we can revisit it and kind of build up our willpower reserves, seeing our ideal version of the future, but then to make sure not to leave that an ideal version of the future. Because if we don't connect it to the moment, we never actually take action. So we need to connect our ideal version of the future to some sort of instant gratification. And that's the first step in building new habits. Now let's talk a little bit about why habits form and why it's so important to do habits every day for best results. So first off, let's start with why habits form. This is coming out of The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg again. He says that habits, scientists say, emerge because the brain is constantly looking for ways to save effort. Left to its own devices, the brain will try to make almost any routine into a habit because habits allow our minds to ramp down more often. This is an effort-saving instinct and it's a huge advantage. An efficient brain requires less room, which makes for a smaller head, which makes childbirth easier and therefore causes fewer infant and mother deaths. An efficient brain also allows us to stop thinking constantly about basic behaviors, such as walking and choosing what to eat, so that we can devote mental energy to inventing spears, irrigation systems, and eventually airplanes and video games. So habits are really just a way our brains go about saving effort, controlling the amount of calories that we spend in a day. And that's really what the brain is all about. That's what it's designed for. It's all about conserving energy. So if you have to do something regularly, the brain will make it automatic. If you ever felt like you forgot your entire drive home, this is a great example of it. It's terrifying because the brain can put really complex things like driving a motor vehicle completely on autopilot. And this is actually why I and many other experts say that habits are actually neither good or bad. Really what habits are is the brain's way of making something that you do regularly automatic, conserving energy. Whether that habit potentially has a negative or positive outcome in your life, it doesn't really matter to the brain. All it knows is the thing that you're doing regularly, it's going to make automatic. So here's an exercise. Now that we know why habits are formed and how they're formed and the reason why it's kind of a feature, not a bug of the human, we want to be able to look into the habits that we currently have. And that's what this exercise is all about. So the first step is to test your awareness. What are some habits that you currently have in your life? Preferably, we want to spend some time looking at the ones that you didn't actually intentionally create and might not even think of as habits. Think about the way that you wake up in the morning. Think about the way that you make your coffee in the morning. Think about what you do throughout the day, maybe at your first break or your second break or during your lunchtime. All those things are habits that you do time and time again, every single day. But 
you don't think of those as habits. You just think of those as, oh, this is just what I'm supposed to do right now. The ease of those activities that you're doing is the ease of the activities that you could be doing as well. There is certainly a period where if you're not just falling into the habit and you're intentionally trying to create something, that it's going to be difficult to push through. But the feeling that you have when you're waking up in the morning, making your coffee, following your lunchtime routine or your nighttime routine, the feeling that you get there of just ease and of course this is what I'm going to do next, this is what I do every time, that's what a habit will truly feel like given enough time. Spending some time in reflection around those habits that you didn't intentionally create will give you a good idea of just how much of your life is built upon habits and what it can feel like, the ease that can come over you when you've built up a habit of your desire. The next point we're going to talk about here is something I love from Jerry Seinfeld. He's talking about using things, using the power of every day to build habits in a way that sticks. So this is coming from Many Habits, another really great book on habits. He says that Jerry Seinfeld appears to be the pioneer in many habits. He famously marked each day on his calendar with a big X if he completed his joke writing task. He recognized that daily progress was the key to forming a habit and improving his craft of telling jokes. He first told young comedian Brad Isaac about his productivity secret before a show one day. And then Brad wrote about Seinfeld's response in an article for Lifehacker. After a few days, you'll have a chain. Just keep at it and the chain will grow longer every day. You'll like seeing the chain, especially when you get a few weeks under your belt. Your only job is not to break the chain. This is a good summation of mini habit. We don't want to break the chain. So the reason that I combined these two different points into the daily note here on the mind map is because now that we know why habits form, really what it is, is the brain repatterning itself because you're doing something every single day. And then Jerry, or, you know, many habits, came up with a really great tip to break past the period where it doesn't feel like a habit yet. And that's by creating a chain. So what we do, what do we do once we have our many habits in place? So for, for example, we have an idea of the fundamentals that we want to follow. We have an idea of the meditation we want to follow, maybe what our keystone habit is going to be. In other words, we have a plan of attack. We know which habits we want to go after. Then it's important to understand why and how habits are created. And then we need a simple tip like creating a habit chain in order to get yourself to actually go through with the more painful period of habit creation, which of course is right at the very beginning. The chain could be something like a check on the calendar, a digital to-do list, or anything else that you can think of. But the idea here is to give yourself a visual cue of your accomplishments. This not only reinforces the self-efficacy piece that we talked about earlier, but it also visualizes our momentum. We can start to feel ourselves moving forward with our new habits. And that's a very big part of instant gratification, what we talked about before. So if we, if we talk about Newton for a second, getting things done requires a good deal of momentum. Momentum requires stringing a lot of good days together. And Jerry's calendar chain is a good representation of that momentum. Essentially, what we're saying here is we need enough momentum to get out of the initial period of habit formation where we need to just repeat the habit over and over again until our brains put it on autopilot. Now, creating this chain is a really great way to get ourselves to feel a little bit of instant gratification every single time we mark the calendar with an X, and eventually that will propel us into habit creation. Plus, humans have a weird avoidance of breaking chains, so we're going not only with the positive of instant gratification, but we can also have this weird avoidance of not breaking chains to our advantage. We're also avoiding a certain amount of pain if we were to break the chain. So here it is. Here's the actual activity. Give it a try. First, revisit what you might want to accomplish. Again, we're going back to our why. We're looking at our fundamentals and our keystone habits. Decide where you want to start. Decide what your keystone habit might be. Now, what mini habit do you need to get there? 
This one's a little bit out of place. We're going to talk about easy coming up in the mind map here. But essentially, once you have the easy piece of the habit done, then you want to mark it on the calendar every single day. Start to create a chain, do some mini celebrations, get that instant gratification, and also feel the gravity of the chain and not wanting to break your streak. Now we're at one of my favorite spots in the entire mind map, and that is easy. And inside of the easy node, we're going to talk about making our habits stupid. And again, this is coming from Mini Habits, a really great book on habits. A mini habit is basically a much smaller version of a new habit that you want to form. 100 push-ups daily is minified into one push-up daily. Writing 3,000 words daily becomes writing 50 words daily. Thinking positively all the time becomes thinking just two positive thoughts a day. Living an entrepreneurial lifestyle becomes thinking of two different ideas per day, among other entrepreneurial things. The foundation of the mini habit system is in the stupid small steps. The concept of small steps is of course nothing new, but how and why they work have not been adequately dissected. Of course, small steps are relative too. A small step for you could be a giant leap for me. Saying stupid small clarifies it. Because if a step sounds stupid relative to the most that you can do, that's actually the perfect step for you. So we've already talked about target habits. We've talked about keystone habits, talked about the fundamentals. We've talked about habits that you would want to create. But it might be something that you want to pick up while for a while or something that you're brand new to. Again, you want to link this as much to your keystone habit as you can if you're just beginning the habit creation process. But maybe it's something like eating healthier. Maybe it's like doing more exercise or maybe it's reading more. All really great habits to start with. All good keystone habits, in my opinion, depending on where you're at in your life. Again, Charles Duhigg talked about how the fundamentals of moving is so, so important. Human beings tend to stay healthier if we move. We tend to make healthier choices and just change in general if we're exercising enough. Let's take that habit, that keystone habit, that fundamental that you want to put in your life and make it stupid small together. Eating healthier becomes eating one vegetable a day. Doing more exercise becomes doing just one push-up a day. Reading more becomes reading just one page a day. So what I would suggest that you do right now is take your keystone habit, write it inside of this mind map, and make it stupid. Make it incredibly small. What's the smallest amount that you could do so that if you have that as your habit, have that as part of your chain, that you almost no matter what, something incredibly, incredibly terrible would have to happen for you not to be able to do your one push-up read your one page of the book, eat your one vegetable. And of course, we're not going to stop at any one of those things. We're not necessarily going to stop at one push-up if we feel like doing 10. We're just breaking the momentum and we're just keeping the momentum on our X marks the spot Jerry Seinfeld chain. Of course, we want to keep that chain up as much as we possibly can. And by doing one vegetable, one push-up or reading one page, we set up our environment to allow us to continue on if we feel like it, something we'll talk about a little bit later as well. So you might be thinking, okay, Ethan, I came to this course. I thought that we were going to learn how to change our habits completely, right? But this seems like it's a little too small. It seems like it's stupid. The point of these mini habits is to make it so small that it's not even almost stupid, that it really is stupid. That way, even on your worst possible day, you could at least do this one thing. And X marks the spot on the calendar for the Jerry Seinfeld chain. This is going to help you build consistency before you try and set up your habits to be a little bit more difficult. Remember up here, stupid small is going to be different for everyone. Your stupid small might be different than my stupid small. I might be able to do one push-up a day, and you might be able to commit to 10. But just because you have nine more push-ups doesn't make it any less important for you to follow the chain. Making it easy, making it stupid small, is one of the biggest hacks 
for creating any new habit. So what does this look like? And this, of course, is coming from Tiny Habits, another really, really great book. But what does a tiny habit look like? Okay, there's three different spots. Number one is you've got your anchor moment, an existing routine like brushing your teeth, something like we talked about before, and we'll talk about a little bit more in If Then, or an event that happens like a phone ringing, the anchor moment reminds you to do the tiny behavior. This was called a cue inside of The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. It's called different things in different books about habits, but an anchor moment is really, really good. A pre-existing routine. This is why I connected my meditation to my coffee first thing in the morning, for example. Number two is the new tiny behavior, a simple version of the new habit that you want, such as flossing just one tooth or doing just two push-ups, like we talked about inside of Make It Stupid. You do the tiny behavior immediately after the anchor moment. And then number three, it's instant celebration. It's instant gratification. Double down on instant gratification. So, so, so important. Something you do to create positive emotions, such as saying, I did a good job, or that's like me. You celebrate immediately after doing the tiny behavior. So it goes anchor, tiny behavior, celebration. And that's what easy looks like. So the best way to get above the action line. So the action line inside of tiny habits is the line of whether you're doing the habit or you're not doing the habit. So the best way to get above the line of actually doing our habits, actually taking the action, is to follow your ABCs. The goal here is to make things as easy as possible to create a repeatable habit. Each one of the ABCs accomplish that. So ABCs, right? We've got anchor behavior celebration. First, I want to try and create a daily meditation practice. Every morning, I drink coffee without fail, and that's what I'm going to anchor my meditation too. B is for behavior or tiny behavior in this case. All I need to do is sit on the couch without distraction. There's no actual practice needed. Now, if I sit down on the couch and I want to do some breath work, if I sit on the couch and I want to try some different mindfulness techniques that I might have picked up along the way, that's great. But to get the X marks the spot, to get the instant celebration, All I need is to sit on that couch without distraction. And that brings us to number three of the ABCs, instant celebration, instant C. This is something that I need to work on, but something like hell yes or good job or awesome, that has a really nice ring to it. Every time I sit on that couch, I should be celebrating myself. And celebration leads into instant gratification, which of course, We talked about how the human mind is built for instant gratification, how if you don't build instant gratification into your routines, you're very unlikely to stick to them long term. And the crazy part here is that once we finish that first tiny action, we're much more likely to do more. When I'm on the couch undistracted, I generally feel like taking some long, deep breaths. Sometimes I even feel like chanting a mantra or doing different meditation techniques that I've learned along the way. But that's enough about me. Here are some actionable steps for the behavior design process when it comes to making things easy. Now, some of these things we talked about before, I think that inside of Tiny Habits is just boiled down into a very good seven-step process. You want to clarify your aspiration. And of course, we talked about that inside of why. Clarify your aspiration. Very important to know where you're going to go. Then you want to explore different behavior options. This might be in your fundamentals, your keystones, or even inside of willpower with meditation. You want to know what behavior options are going to lead you towards your aspiration. Ideally, you want to pick one piece, one keystone that's going to topple a lot of the other things that seem to be in your way. You want to match that with a specific behavior. You want to say, okay, you know what? Uh, Meditation is going to help me and meditation might help me, but it won't help me unless I have a specific thing that I need to do. For example, sitting on the couch with your coffee is my specific behavior. So you want to go from meditation, having a clear mind is going to help me get to my aspiration, get to my goal, understand my why, connect to my purpose. But step number three, it needs to be very specific. And while it's being specific, 
you want to start as tiny as you can. Start with just two minutes of meditation. Start with just one push-up. That's where you want to begin. Step number five is to find a good prompt. And we talked about this a little bit here today, but the best prompts are ones that are already in your life. And we're going to talk about prompts actually in the very next point, if then, if then is all about prompts. But step number six is to celebrate your success. Again, celebrate your success and double down on that instant gratification. Again, if we don't have instant gratification, we are very unlikely as human beings because our brains are built for instant gratification to actually stick to anything. Step number seven, of course, is troubleshoot, iterate, and expand. I think a lot of times when we're on the habit building process, we have a tendency to think that it's going to work automatically because I watched a mind map video about exactly how to build habits, or I read a book about exactly how to build habits. Of course, everyone is a little bit different along the path, and every habit is a little bit different as well. It's going to be a little different for you, and you need to be ready for that. You need to be able to troubleshoot you need to be able to iterate, and you need to be able to continue with the process, which we're going to talk about inside a process, and we also are going to talk about inside of mind map, mindset. Next, we're going to talk about maybe the most important part in the habit building process, and definitely the most overlooked piece, if then, or cues, or and really, they're called a million different things in each one of these different books. Cues, prompts, essentially things that are going to make us take action. And what I call these is if then. I call them IFTT, if this, then that. If then cues, and I'm even going to give you my favorite IFTT habit. So if then, IFTT actually doesn't come from a habit book. It comes from Rethinking Positive Thinking by Gabrielle Oetengen, probably my favorite book on the channel, definitely underrated, as is this tip. As time passed and Peter conducted more studies, he came to realize that forming a plan for how to attain a certain goal, what he termed an implementation intention, had a more powerful effect if it took on the particular form of an if-then statement. If situation X arises, then I will perform response Y. Let's suppose that Jim feels inexplicably anxious when his regional manager stops by his office. So it's difficult for Jim to start up a conversation or ask a question. Jim's implementation intention might be, if I become nervous talking to my regional manager, then I will remind myself that I'm the top performing salesperson in this district and my sales have increased since last year. Or potentially, if I become nervous to my regional manager, then I will excuse myself for a moment, take a few deep breaths to calm down, and return to the conversation. So now that we know what our obstacles might be, right? So some of the things that we are going to have as obstacles in any habit building process might be things like our old bad habits, our habits that are going to be in our way along the journey. Maybe we're trying to kick a certain bad habit, or maybe we just have a habit of procrastinating like we talked about inside of Keystone Habits. We know what our obstacles might be, so we need to know what we might do when they happen. So let's say, for example, after a hard day at work, you're going to go through the drive through and have some kind of... Uh, some kind of fast food or something like that, you need to be prepared for that. You need to have an if-then statement for that. So for me, this is such a great strategy. If-then is a big part of my day as a marketer. Maybe some of you guys can relate if you're inside of marketing or inside of IT. Inside marketing, you might say, if someone opens this email, then send them this sale, for example. I hadn't thought about using that in my own life before I read this book, but it's already paying dividends. Here are a couple of examples that I use for if-then statements. If I feel like snacking at night, then I will brush my teeth and take a book to bed early. If I feel lethargic or want to procrastinate, then I will do 20 squats and get back to work. Now, these could be a little bit tinier, if I'm honest, while I'm reading these back over. These could be tinier. These are The brushing the teeth is, is maybe the best example, um, and three deep breaths is really great. 20 squats is probably not ideal. If I feel myself getting upset, then I will take three deep breaths, standing as tall as I possibly can. 
what I want you to do here is let's take some time. What are your obstacles? What are the times that you're feeling your bad habits kick in? Let's make a few if-then statements for your life. If obstacle arises, then I will overcome it in this way. Now, of course, if-then isn't directly connected to habits, but it is a really good way to cue your habits, which we're going to talk about in a minute here. So do you ever have a conversation with yourself in the moments around when your obstacles come up? If you're about to do a bad habit or if you're about to kind of fall into uh, a, a place where you don't feel like your best self, let's just say, most of us are like, yeah, that happens all the time. I'm having a conversation with myself at all times of the day, whether I should eat this, whether I shouldn't eat this, whether I should do this work, whether I shouldn't do this work, whether I should watch Netflix or whether I shouldn't watch Netflix. Those conversations are burning willpower at an astounding rate in your life. And we talked about how important willpower is for building up habits, leaving us vulnerable to giving up on our plans. This is one of the secrets of IFTT and the implementation intentions process. If we decide what we'll do when the inevitable obstacles come up, we can save our willpower for when the ones that we don't see coming happen. Of course, we have certain habits that we want to break, and this is more what the IFTT piece is about, at least in the very beginning here. We're going to talk about cues in a second. But if you have habits that you want to break, IFTT, creating an if-then statement, is probably your best possible way to get out of it. So let's say, for example, you're getting home at the end of the day, and you don't just want to watch Netflix all night like you have been doing for the past few months. Well, you need to think about that before you actually need to make the decision. So you come home at the end of your workday and your workout clothes need to be laid out so that you can get outside and go for a walk or go for uh, a run or have a quick exercise session before you start watching Netflix, right? That's an if-then situation. Next, we're going to talk about if-then cues. Of course, inside of the easy, we talked about having to move above the action line and using anchors or action cues or really just anything in our life that is already going to happen that we know, we use that as a cue to start a habit. And this is coming from the power of habit again. If you want to start running each morning, it's essential that you choose a simple cue. I was doing a little bit of foreboding here with the exercise one. Like always, lacing up your sneakers before breakfast or leaving your running clothes next to your bed and a clear reward such as a midday treat, a sense of accomplishment for recording your miles, or the endorphin rush that you get from a jog. But countless studies have shown that a cue and a reward on their own actually aren't enough for your new habit to last. Only when your brain starts expecting the reward, craving the endorphins or sense of accomplishment, will it become automatic for you to lace up your jogging shoes each morning. The cue, in addition to triggering a routine, must also trigger a craving for the reward to come. So really here, what we're talking about is the cue, the anchor, the if-then statement, all of that stuff is really just the beginning of our habit loop. Each step of the habit loop is important in and of itself. Of course, we talked about the ABCs before. We talked about the anchor, the behavior, and really the celebration, the instant congratulations that you're giving yourself. But often we don't even think about the routine, what we want. To, often we only think about the routine, sorry, about what we actually want to do and the reward, what we're going to get if we actually do the habit. The secret here is that nothing ever happens inside of building habits without some sort of a cue. So how do we create a cue? How do we create an if then in our lives? From my experience, the easiest way for you to create a cue is to attach a habit to something that you're already doing. Drinking coffee goes to meditation. Going to sleep goes to reading. Break at work goes to breathing deeply. But of course, Charles shows us how we can set up a cue the night before, which is also a super effective way of using if-then. You're preparing for a situation that might happen before the situation happens, saving yourself just that little bit of willpower that it might take to actually get the habit to be done. So whatever you decide to do, Make it a clear cue that is easily set up and repeatable. And remember, just a cue isn't enough. More about this later, but the cue that we set up must actually lead to a reward. 
if it's going to set up our habit loop, meaning that you must actually give yourself something, some type of a reward after the routine for it to stick. Remember that the cue must lead to a feeling of reward versus a feeling of work. And this is what we're going to talk about inside of mindset. This is actually coming directly out of No Sweat by Michelle Seeger, a really great book all about exercise. But she talks about, do you view exercise as a chore or do you view exercise as a gift? And the more that we can see our cues as leading to a gift of a habit, the better we're going to be able to stick to them. Next, I thought I would share with you just my favorite IFTT habit. So this is coming from the willpower instinct. Susan Segerstorm, a psychologist at the University of Kentucky, studies how states of mind like stress and hope influence the body. She has found that just like stress, self-control has a biological signature. The need for self-control sets into motion a coordinated set of changes in the brain and the body that help you resist temptation and override self-destructive urges. Segerstrom calls those changes the pause and plan response, which couldn't look more different from the fight or flight response that we're used to. So what is the opposite of the flight or fight response? Interesting, we talked about willpower in the very beginning. I'm linking back, here's how you can get some more willpower in the moment with a simple if then statement. So I'm trying to take all of the lessons from the mind map and put them into specific actions that you can take in your life as well. So what's the exact opposite of fight or flight? We've all been there before. We've all been in this fight or flight response. Something stresses us out at work or at home, and suddenly we can't think straight, and our heart is racing, pounding, and our breathing is fast and shallow. That's the fight or flight response, which is not where willpower lives. Pause and plan is the willpower-based response. Here's what it looks like coming directly from Kelly. Your brain needs to bring your body on board with your goals and put brakes on your impulses. And isn't that really what habits are all about? Putting brakes on our impulses. To do this, your prefrontal cortex will communicate the need for self-control to lower brain regions that regulate your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, and other autonomic responses. The pause and plan response drives you in the opposite direction of the fight or flight response. Instead of speeding up, your heart slows down and your blood pressure stays normal. Instead of hyperventilating like a madman, you take a deep breath and instead of tensing your muscles, prime, priming them for action, your body relaxes a little bit. So wouldn't this be an interesting response to stress if we could communicate to our body that instead of stressing out during a time like this, it might be better for us to relax so that we can preserve our willpower throughout the day. So how do we shift from this fight or flight to a pause and plan response? Meditation, again, is a great way to start. Building up those muscles of awareness and detachment is important. But coming up next is an in-the-moment hack for calming the mind and moving to pause and plan all about the mindset, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit later. Essentially here, with the pause and plan IFTT, you would say something like, if I start to feel agitated, then I will take a pause. I will relax. Instead of what I would normally do, which is hyperventilate and let my heart beat wildly. Instead of reacting in a fight or flight way, I am going to choose to calm down. And that's going to really preserve your willpower and allow you to follow the process of habit building a little bit easier. Next, we're going to talk about the process. We're going to start by talking about the three steps or the three phases of habit creation. And then we're going to talk about the success cycle or essentially how to continue on being successful with any habit that you try and create. First, we're going to talk about the three steps, which is coming directly from The Miracle Morning, which isn't a book so much on habits, but more around setting up your life for success. However, The Miracle Morning is reliant in large part on habit. So inside the book, Hal says, considering that our habits create our life, which is essentially what we've been talking about throughout this entire course, 
There is arguably no single skill that is more important for you to learn than the master of controlling your habits. You must identify, implement, and maintain the habits necessary for creating the results that you want in your life, while learning how to let go of any negative habits which are holding you back from achieving your true potential. So you can see that the way that we structured the course, the way that we structured the masterclass, is first by identifying which habits are the most important for you, talking a little bit about willpower, going into the fundamentals, the keystones, and the why, and then implementing. We're talking about the the daily, the easy, the if-then, how to set up your life so that your habits actually stick. And then, of course, the final two points are all about maintaining the habits necessary for creating the results that you want. So the number one skill that we can learn, of course, is how to master and control our habits, breaking the ones that we know we need to break and adopting the ones that we know we should adopt. There's no faster way to change your life than to change your habits. And my sneaking suspicion is that you already know that if you're already here. Remember how the days stack up into years. Remember how the years stack up into an entire lifetime. And habits stack up the entire, the the exact same way. So how we can go about changing our habits goes through three different phases in Hal's opinion. And I think this is a really great point that we need to think about. Even when we know our exact right why, we've identified what habits we want to change or create, we understand how to implement the correct processes. We understand how to make them easy. We understand how to create change. We understand that if then or cues is an extremely important part of the habit building process. We still need to know that phase number one is going to be unbearable. This phase is hard and we don't like doing it. Each of these phases is going to last about 10 days or so. It's going to be different depending on the habit that you're trying to create and depending on you as a person. But phase number one pretty much universally is unbearable. This phase is hard and we don't like doing it. But we must persist and push past this 10-day window where what we're trying to accomplish is extremely difficult. Phase number two is uncomfortable. It's not quite as bad as phase number one. But it's still difficult, and this is lasting another 10 days or so. We still need to persist. We might need to set up ways to make sure that we're not quitting. We might need to elicit the help of some other people. We might need to join a community that's doing some kind of a 30-day challenge or something like that in the very beginning to help us continue to push through phase number one and phase number two. Phase number three is unstoppable. Habit starts to engage, and we don't need to use as much willpower to keep us going. So the reason I included this specifically into this part of the masterclass, where we're wrapping it up, we went through a lot of really great principles, a lot of great strategies for how you can create habits and make them as easy as possible to do. We make them easy, we make them daily, and we know that we need a cue. Those are all very, very important. Not to mention we need to identify the right habits so that we know that the amount of energy and willpower that we put into them is going to give us a good return. But there is still going to be this three-phase process. There's still going to be about 20 days, 21 days, if you want to pick a, a number that transcends through society. About 21 days is how long it's going to be extremely difficult for you to actually continue on with the new habit that you're trying to create or breaking the old habit. You can look forward to that and you can see that 21 days as a challenge or you can wake up every day and be not expecting it to be difficult and be expecting that you can make it easy. And if it's not easy, you must be doing something wrong or it's not the right habit All of these things come into our head when we are going through these first two phases, especially in the first 10 days. We need to know that those are going to be there. We need to know that our mind is going to try and talk us out of this for whatever reason. And we need to know that we must persist. Our next point here is all about the success cycle. And this is coming again from No Sweat, the book on exercise that I really loved as a book on habit. The successful cycle of motivation starts with the right why, your right why. Now you are choosing to move for more relevant and compelling reasons, and you also are choosing physical activities that give you immediate positive feedback. So while reading this, just think of 
physical activity as anything that you're trying to create, any of the habits that we've talked about before. Walking for 10 minutes gives you more energy. Remember, reading one book gives you a sense of accomplishment. Reading a page should give you a sense of accomplishment. You're enjoying being present in the moment when you swim. Gardening makes you smile. You're sharing stories and laughter with your close friends as you work out. Physical activity, or the new habit, feels like a gift. And that's what we're trying to create here, right? We go through the first three phases. We go through specifically the first two phases that are going to be difficult. It's not going to feel like a gift. It's not going to feel easy. But once we get into that third phase, we want to focus on creating the success cycle in our life. So we want to make sure that that habit feels like a gift instead of a chore. It's now a want because you reap the rewards like fun with your family, focus at work, and feeling centered. Again, this is from instant gratification. Connecting directly to that is the only way that we can create this self-perpetuating cycle of success. So it's a gift that keeps on giving. Each time you do the habit, each time you follow through with your intentions, you're not going to want to stop because you get a reward immediately. You find that you can repeat these experiences at any time that you like, and this motivation becomes self-perpetuating. That's what we're looking for. We have to go through the first two steps, but then in the third stage, we can set ourselves up for success by using this self-perpetuating cycle of making sure that the habit is in and of itself rewarding in the moment. You feel better because you're moving your body or doing your habit in ways that you determine for yourself and that you naturally want to keep moving or you naturally want to keep the habit up because you're seeing the benefits in the moment. Success in anything necessitates that it's self-perpetuating. And I love the idea of a cycle here. Actually, the cover of the book, No Sweat, is a bicycle. And that's I really, really love that. When you start with the right why, you get an immediate benefit from doing the action. Then because you get an immediate benefit from doing the action, you want to do it again. And that's the success cycle. And really this process that we're talking about here can use the analogy of a bicycle. In the very beginning, you have to pedal hard even just to get going. But once you've got a little bit of momentum, each piece or each little piece of energy that you put into the bicycle means that you're moving forward faster and faster and faster. Breaking the no momentum and moving into momentum is definitely the hardest part. And we talked about how that might be about 21 days. But if we can focus on the success cycle, feeling good in the moment because we're doing the habits, that's the way that we can continue to use momentum to our advantage. So how do we make sure that we're on a success cycle rather than a failure cycle. This is about starting with our why, something that we talked about quite a long time ago in the masterclass. We don't wanna draw our motivation from something in the future like losing weight, running a marathon, or being healthy, right? Those things might get you through the first stage of the process, right? Those things, losing weight or that sort of thing, might get you through phase number one and phase number two, you might be able to kind of grit it out and get through those first two phases, but it certainly isn't going to sustain you through phase number three. Instead, we want to focus on instant gratification. We want to focus on things like clearing our mind, feeling accomplished, or connecting with others. Those types of things that give us an actual reward in the moment. Again, we want to connect our cue and follow it as quickly as we possibly can with a reward. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So let's set up your exercise cycle. This is just an example. Of course, you can have many other habits. I recommend you use this for your keystone habit or one of the fundamentals that we talked about before. But let's set up the exercise cycle for now so you can see how it might be done. First, Start with your why that you want to exercise. Again, we want to draw from something that is instant gratification rather than something in the future. Something like clearing your mind, feeling accomplished, or connecting with others are all good examples of why you might exercise. And then you want to look for what she calls in the book, opportunities to move. But really what that is, is that's easy. That's the thing that we talked about before. Making the habits as stupid as you possibly can. 
She talks about parking further away from the grocery store. She talks about getting up from your desk at work and simple, simple, small, easy, stupid things that you can do that are going to lead to something much larger down the line. So first, you want to start with your why. You want to understand that you're drawing your motivation from instant gratification. Next, you want to pick a very stupid habit, something as easy as you possibly can make it, so that you know even on your worst day that you're going to be able to accomplish it. And then finally, we want to celebrate our wins. We want to feel accomplished. We want to understand that our mind is clear. And we want to feel the benefits of connecting with others and draw our motivation from instant gratification to help keep the cycle going. Now again, on our three different phases, phase number one is going to be unbearable. Helping ourselves out by drawing motivation from instant gratification is certainly one way to go. I don't want to give you the illusion that phase number one is going to be any easier because you've somehow figured out how to draw internal motivation. Same with phase number two. But in my opinion, and in my experience, not only with myself, but with clients, phase number three is not only easier with success cycle motivation, intrinsic and also instant motivation, but rather, it's not possible without it. So you may as well start with trying to get the success cycle off the ground, rather than focusing on a why that might be extrinsic and could be far in the future. Next, we're going to talk about mindset. Mindset, perhaps the most important part of lasting success in any kind of, th- any kind of habit change or any lifestyle change that you're trying to make. We need to have the right mindset in order for all of these things to work. In order for us, even if we understand the fundamentals and keystone, we understand exactly how to create habits through why, daily, easy, and if then, and we understand the process of how habits are made, We still need to have the right mindset and we need to approach it in the correct way in order for lasting success to be available to us. This is coming directly from Atomic Habits with James Clear, one of the best books that I read on habits. But the most important point that I feel wasn't really talked about enough in some of the other books was that identity change is the north star of habit change. The true question is... Are you becoming the type of person that you want to become? This is really deep into intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. The first step is not what or how or but who. You need to know who you want to be. Otherwise, your quest for change is like a boat without a rudder. And that's why we're starting here. So he actually starts with this, but I know that people wanted to dive directly into the how part of it. This why, this piece of who are you, is extremely important to the entire process. You have the power to change your beliefs about yourself. Your identity is not set in stone. You have a choice in every moment, and you can choose the identity that you want to reinforce today with habits that you choose today. And this brings us to the deeper purpose of this book and the real reason that habits matter. Building better habits isn't about littering your day with life hacks. It's not about flossing one tooth each night and taking a cold shower each morning or wearing the same outfit each day. It's not about achieving external measures of success like earning more money or losing weight or reducing stress. Habits can help you achieve all of those things, of course, but fundamentally, they're not about having something. They are about becoming someone. Ultimately, your habits matter because they help you become the type of person that you wish to be. They are the channel through which you develop your deepest beliefs about yourself. Quite literally, again, you become your habits, and your habits become you. So what we're talking about here is who are you? And life hacks in particular is a good piece of this quote that I want to talk about. Because quite honestly, everything we talked about today, you could take everything we talked about inside this masterclass, you could take and turn into life hacks. You certainly could, and some of you might even do that, and that's okay. But life hacks are very popular nowadays, with the media selling them as the salve to cure our ails. Not only do these not lead to any real measurable success, he talks about cold showers, he talks about losing a certain amount of weight, making a certain amount of money. These don't lead to real measurable success. These don't lead to some kind of success as far as happiness goes. 
but they actually confuse our identity because you're not acting as yourself. You're acting as the person who created this life hack or you're acting as the person who tells you how to act. So a really good place to start, even though we're finishing off here, a really good place to start when you go about trying to create new habits for yourself is to ask a simple question. Who do I want to become? This is the question that you should be asking before you decide the habits you want to develop and change. So we talked about the fundamentals, we talked about the keystone habits, we talked about your why, but this is a little deeper than the why. This is the meta. This is understanding that you are going to become your habits and your habits are an extension of you. So we're talking about identity here. Do you see yourself as a healthy and fit athlete? Do you see yourself as a successful business person? Do you see yourself as a family member? Here's a quick meditation that you can try. Take time to think on this. Quiet time is where you listen to your thoughts and it can be extremely helpful here. What is truly you and what is something that was given to you? So this is something that I suggest you spend some time thinking about. Not necessarily because it's going to help you. I mean, everything that we talked about today as far as building habits, which habits I think that you should start with and which habits I think you should build, that all stays the same. But who are you is inviting you to bring your own uniqueness to the habit building process and to building the correct habits for you. The more that you repeat a behavior, the more you reinforce the identity associated with that behavior. In fact, the word identity was originally derived from the Latin word essentias, which means being, and identium, which means repeatedly. Your identity is literally your repeated beingness. Your, whatever your identity is now, you only believe it because you have proof. So those are two separate quotes. But you'll remember we started off the entire mind map with this idea from Aristotle. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. And really, you could change this up. James Clear is essentially saying, we are what we repeatedly do. We are not an act, but we are a habit. So we need to think about, okay, what we are what we repeatedly do. And if we want to change our identity, we need to have some proof. So quite simply, you can't just think about, am I a healthy and fit athlete? Am I a successful business person? Am I a good family member, right? You need to show yourself that that's who you truly are. James talks about how to change your identity by repeating the desired behavior as frequently as possible. And if you want to repeat your desired behavior, you want to live from your new identity. So you can talk about these sorts of things, but you also need to have some sort of proof. Dr. Shad Helmsetter says, you are what you tell yourself. Self-talk is what you say to yourself all the time. Listening and modifying your self-talk can be an extremely powerful habit when trying to make habit change. Habits are changed easiest at the identity level and supported and reinforced at the behavior level. So you need to spend some time, you might want to spend some time, kind of refocusing yourself around who you want to become and who you see yourself as. Spending some time visualizing yourself as that person that you want to become and spending some time taking an inventory of your own self-talk and seeing what you're saying to yourself currently about the habits that you have and the habits that you don't have. It's a really good meditative exercise for you if you're finding yourself struggling with any of these points here in particular. Our next point is all about whether you think. And this is actually coming from a learning book called Make It Stick, but really it's all from Mindset by Carol Dweck. Let's return to the old saying, if you think you can or you think you can't, then you're right. It turns out there's more truth here than wit. Attitude counts for a lot. The studies of psychologist Carol Dweck have gotten huge attention for showing just how big an impact one simple conviction can have on learning and performance. The belief that your level of intellectual ability is not fixed, but rests to a large degree in your own hands. Now, this is not only just your own intellectual ability, but also every other ability. It's about the habits and etc. Dweck's research has been 
triggered by her curiosity over why some people become helpless when they encounter challenges and fail at them, whereas others respond to failure by trying new strategies and redoubling on their efforts. She found that a fundamental difference between the two responses lies in how a person attributes their failure. Those whose attitude is who those who attribute failure to their own inability, I'm not intelligent, for example, or I can't do this habit, for example, become helpless. And those who interpret failure as the result of insufficient effort or ineffective strategy dig deeper and try different approaches. And of course, you can guess which mindset we want. And if we're going to change our abilities, we need to change our mind first. So what are your own thoughts on your abilities? And again, this is coming back to negative self-talk. This is something important to keep in mind when you're trying to change your habits. Quite often, we completely miss this part of the process where it says, you know, we need to redouble down. We need to continually revisit and reiterate on the habits that we're trying to create because we're not going to get it right the first time. Most of us have a running self-track of self-talk in our minds, and a lot of that can end up being pretty negative. We think we're stupid because we can't get ourselves to meditate. We think we're lazy because we can't get ourselves to exercise. Carol points out in her book just how much of that is actually hindering our ability. She talks about how the idea of I'm not intelligent or I'm not able to do that thing because makes us become helpless to actually change. How might we overcome that negative self-talk, you might be asking? Well, again, inside what you say when you talk to yourself is really a good process. First, we need to be aware of our self-talk. We need to catch ourselves in the act. And next, we need to know that it's not actually us saying it. It's not really true because it's us or our mind saying it's true. Like, for example, if we're trying to get ourselves to exercise and we need to wake up a little bit earlier in order to do that, our mind might say, oh, I can't do that. Is that really true? It comes down to questioning your held beliefs. And then finally, or next, you need to spend some time reprogramming it through using self-talk to your advantage. I recommend that you check out the mind map on what to say when you talk to yourself by Dr. Shad Helmstetter if you're interested in this part of the habit building process. Now, am I saying that if you don't address your negative self-talk that any of these previous nodes and any of these previous lessons won't be helpful? Of course not, right? Understanding willpower is a core piece of understanding how to change your habits. Knowing that fundamentals and keystones, having those in place is going to make the rest of your habits a heck of a lot easier is of course very important. Understanding the process, getting clarity and understanding why you're creating habits, understanding why habits are forming, understanding how to make habits as stupid as possible, understanding cues and what the process might look like are all very, very important. But if you want to take it to a next level, we need to know what the number one factor in actually not even just learning, but being able to change our habits is the belief that you can do it, the belief that you can change your habits. And it's not a simple process. It's actually quite difficult. Even just being aware, even just being inside of the first step can be very difficult. And let alone knowing that it's not really you that's saying these negative things to yourself and knowing that you really need to reprogram yourself, talk to your advantage is of course very difficult. A lot of my coaching clients come to me for help with procrastination. They come to me for help with changing their habits. And mindset plays a huge role inside of this. In fact, I would say that's probably at least 50% of what we talk about on my coaching calls is just the mindset that they have around, am I able to change this habit? Am I able to accomplish what I want? Motivation is a function of wanting something and believing that you can achieve it. And if you're interested at all, in some sort of a coaching relationship, there is a free coaching offer inside of this masterclass. I would be happy to help you through your issues or through your understanding of self-belief. 
Thank you for going through this Habits Masterclass. I really appreciate it. I can't express my gratitude to you enough. I hope you've got quite a lot of ammo in your holster in order to accomplish everything you want in life. Thanks for being with me.